Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, we're going to continue with our character study on the person in the Bible known as Job. Uh, actually, his name is pronounced Job. It's spelled J-O-B. Um, we've already studied the first uh, 11 chapters of the book of Job. So if you haven't seen those uh, episodes, they're already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you will go back and watch those. I'm going to pick up where I left off, uh, and uh, this will be at the beginning of chapter 12. A lot of things have transpired, and rather, rather than recapping it all, uh, please go back and watch the other episodes. So now, uh, chapter 12, the book of Job in the KJV. And Job answered and said, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as these? I am one, I am as one mocked of his neighbor, who calleth upon God, and he answereth him. The just, upright man is laughed to scorn. He that is ready to slip with his feet it is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. So Job is answering the criticism of his three so-called friends. Um, Job has been afflicted uh, because Satan met with God. God asked Satan, well, what do you have to say about my servant Job? And Satan told Job, God that the only reason Job is, is so good is because you bless him so much. You've given him health and prosperity and everything so no wonder he's happy with you and praises you but if you let me take these things away from him then you'll see what job is really like that he will curse you so this is a test that uh, is going on here uh, and so far um, god has taken away uh, god not god has taken away but he has permitted Satan to take away Job's uh, family and uh, property and uh, his health. So Job is at the point where he's really suffering physically with boils on his body from the bottoms of the feet to the top of his head. And Three men come to visit him, or are supposed to be his friends, and all they do is criticize him and, and point the finger and saying, the reason this is happening to you is because you've sinned, you're guilty, you must have done something to deserve, deserve this. <clears throat> so that's the, how the conversation has been going, and Job is answering him. I'm going to look at this. <clears throat> I'm a KJV firstist. I always look at the KJV first. But I find oftentimes it's helpful for me to look at a modern translation. One that I find helpful is the Amplified because it amplifies the scripture. It doesn't simply translate it. It, it puts in a kind of commentary within the verse. Kind of what I'm doing here, I'm commenting on the verses as I read them. <clears throat> and the Amplified, <clears throat> whoever the writers were of it, uh, they put in their own interpretations and, and uh, uh, comments to help explain it. So let's look at the Amplified. And it says, then Job responded to his accusers. No doubt you are the only wise people in the world and wisdom will die with you. <laughs> so Job is being sarcastic, uh, telling his accusers, his so-called friends, uh, 
you think you're you know it all you think you're going to you're the one to understand that what's going on here you're no doubt you are the only wise people in the world and wisdom will die with you but i have intelligence and understanding as well as you i am not inferior to you who does not know such things as these of god's wisdom and might so Uh, on Wednesdays, uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke show is is uh, studying the Book of Proverbs, and uh, in the Book of Proverbs, uh, many times it's saying if you're wise, you will accept counsel from other people, and you'll learn from it and benefit from the counsel. But one thing we have to understand is that sometimes when we get counsel it's not good counsel just because someone says they have the answer yeah it's wise to hear them out but it's not wise to automatically accept their answers uh, they may be wrong just as you know we may be wrong so where do we go to find the truth to find out what really is the correct answer we, we go to the scriptures. We test everything by the scriptures. We find our answers in here. So uh, Job is saying to these people that, uh, look, you're not, you're not any smarter than me. You think you've got the answers here, but uh, you know, you're not superior to me to be teaching me and telling me I'm wrong in here. Uh, and now I'm looking at verse 4. It says, well, let me look at that in the KJV. I am as one mocked of his neighbor who calleth upon God, and he answereth him. The just upright man is laughed to scorn. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. The tabernacles of robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. All right, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified. Verses four through six. I am a joke to my friends. I, one whom God answered when he called upon him, a just and blameless man is a joke and laughed to scorn. Job knows his standing with God. Um, he knows about his faith. He knows it's true. And he's confident in his relationship with God. And he, he's saying that he's being criticized, but they don't really understand. Those, those who are criticizing him, they're the ones that are confused about the situation. He says, they're, they're laughing at me and and it says, I am a joke to my friends, but I am one who God answered when he called upon him. So he's saying, I have a relationship with God and we communicate and he answers me. When I speak to God, he answers me. When I appeal to God, he responds to me. He, said, he says, I am a just and blameless man. He knows that and in, in, in his relationship with God is good. And God loves him. And God's not blaming him. God's not punishing him. That's what he believes. But he says he's a joke. And he's being laughed to scorn by his so-called friends. He who is at ease has contempt for misfortune. But misfortune is ready and anxiously waiting 
for those whose feet slip. He who is at ease has contempt for misfortune. It is easy for us to look at other people and think that their misfortune somehow is is uh, their fault. I know I've been guilty of that in the past. Um, there have been friends and family of mine that have suffered with either financial or health problems. And I didn't have pity, didn't have sympathy for them. I had contempt, just as it says here. I blame them for their problems. Sometimes our problems are a result of our mistakes. We do wrong things and we get bad results. That's what the book of Proverbs teaches us. Teaches us to do the right things and then we will get good results back in our life. But I guess it is typical. And I have been behaved in this typical way where I've seen people who are having misfortune. And instead of having pity and sympathy, I have contempt. I feel like they brought it upon themselves. And that's what these so-called friends of Job are doing here. They're looking at all Job, Job's problems and uh, they have contempt for him. But, he says, but misfortune is ready and anxiously waiting for those whose feet slip. So it could happen to anyone. He's saying, sometimes we all slip, we all make mistakes, we all do foolish things, and sometimes these bad things happen to good people, you know, relatively good. Uh, good people are, we're only good if we compare ourselves to other people. If we grade on a curve, see, the, the scale that God grades us on is a um, pass-fail. You pass if you're perfect. If you're not perfect, you fail. That's God's standard. So according to God, we, we all fail. We all fall short of the glory of God. But the way man kind of grades himself, rates himself, is with the curve. We compare ourselves to other people. I'm relatively good. I'm pretty good compared to these other people. Kind of like that Pharisee was doing when he was praying at the temple and said, oh, God, I'm thankful that I'm not like these other people. They're so bad. And look at all the good things I do. So if you want, you can probably find some people that are worse than you. And that way you then you can feel really good about yourself and even boast how good you are, like the Pharisee did. But it says here, but misfortune is ready and anxiously waiting for those for those whose feet slip, and your feet will slip. My feet have slipped. We all slip. So don't get too cocky. Verse six, the tents of the destroyers prosper, and those who provoke God are apparently secure whom God brings into their power. Well, have you ever wondered why some people that seem to be bad people prosper? I mean, I, I can, I'm not going to mention any names, but I'm thinking of some some people now. One person in particular that is very rich, extremely rich, and yet this person is 
mean-spirited, critical, abusive, immature, childish. And, and yet he's become super rich, a multi-billionaire. And you wonder, how does that happen? How does a person who's uh, clearly so bad in so many ways succeed financially? And that's what this is posing here. It says, the tents of the destroyers prosper. Why is it the people who are destructive, or we can see it clearly, are bad people, and yet they prosper? And those who provoke God are apparently secure. So they're, they're not concerned with God their, or their relationship with God or getting to know God. They're concerned with money, acquiring more wealth. And it seems, it seems like their wealth is secure. Whom God brings into their power. It is true that there is a law of reaping and sowing. If we do the right things, we're going to get good results. If we do the wrong thing, we get bad results. And yet some people prosper even though they're dishonest and they're uh, schemers, scammers, crooked dealers, and that they prosper. And that's what Job was saying here. I'm going to look at the verse 7 in the KJV. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. And the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this. That's a question mark there. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? In whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Doth not the ear try words and the mouth's mouth taste his meat with the ancient is wisdom and in the length of days understanding with him is wisdom and strength he hath counsel and understanding behold he breaketh down and it cannot be built again he shutteth up a man and there can be no opening behold he withholdeth the waters and they dry up also, he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leadeth counselors away spoiled, and maketh the judges fools. He looseth the bond of kings, and girdeth their loins with a girdle. He leadeth princes away, spoiled, and overthroweth the mighty. He removeth away the speech of the trusty, and taketh away the understanding of the aged. He poureth contempt upon princes, and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. He discovereth deep things out of darkness, and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. He increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. He enlargeth the nations and straighteneth them again. He taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way. They grope in the dark without light, and he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. Well, this is Job, Job's answer to his friends, and he's dis describing the sovereignty of God. Now, the sovereignty of God is a fact. But the definition 
of the sovereignty of God has eluded many people. There's a whole faction of professing Christians that call themselves Calvinists that misunderstand what the sovereignty of God is. A Calvinist thinks that God is sovereign in that he controls every single thing. A Calvinist would say that when I lift up my hands, God made me do it. Every word I just spoke, God made me say it. Every thought that comes into my head, every word that comes out of my mouth, every action in my life is controlled by God. I'm merely a robot programmed by God or a puppet controlled by God. That's how a Calvinist sees sovereignty of God. It's true God is sovereign, but he, you, he exercised his sovereignty in a different way. He does not control every minute detail and everything we think, say, and do. He's given man free will, and God has free will, and he has chosen through his sovereignty to allow us to have free will. So God is sovereign in that he is able to do whatever he wants. He's also sovereign in that he elects to not control everything, to give man a free will. And that is essential because only if man has a free will can he be held responsible for his actions. Only if man has free will can he actually love God. Because if God controls it, then we don't really love God because we're not choosing to. It's not up to us. It's God just make, making us seem like we love him. So I think that this, these um, diatribe by Job, this criticism, there's this statements about God and de decrees about how God is, is um, refers to God's sovereignty. Let me look at this in the Amplified now, see if it is helpful. Now ask the animals and let them teach you that God does not deal with his creatures according to their character. And ask the birds of the air, and let them tell you. He seems to think that this is so obvious that even an animal or a bird, a creature, knows this. Why don't you know this? Or speak to the earth with its many forms of life, and it will teach you. And let the fish of the sea declare this truth to you. This is so obvious. Why don't you get it already? Why do I have to even explain it to you? He's saying, who among all these does not recognize in all these things that good and evil are randomly scattered throughout nature and human life? Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Good things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. God is not controlling everything. It's random acts that just happen because God, God set everything in motion. He kind of like puts the plate upon the, the stick and spins it. And then it's, it's going. He got it all started and then it all plays out. But in his sovereignty, he can choose to intervene at any point and he does. And he, he's even done it to such an extreme uh, cases that he does what are called theophanies, where he actually physically comes into the world to interact with us. But whether it's a theophany or Christophany, or whether he is just um, affecting things when he wants to, he does not go to the extreme where he controls everything and makes everything happen. So when bad things happen, don't blame it on God.
that who among all these does not recognize in all these things that good and evil are randomly scattered throughout nature and human life that the hand of the Lord has done this in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind does the ear not put words to the test just as the palate tastes its food distinguishing between the desirable and the undesirable with the aged you say is wisdom and with long life is understanding but only with him are perfect wisdom and might he alone has true counsel and understanding Paul says we we only see like through a, a glass right now it's not clear to us the reality S someday we'll see clearly we'll have real understanding I'm looking forward to that day but don't think that we're going to have a, such understanding that it rises to omniscience and we know everything only God is omniscient only God will ever be omniscient we will know more we will understand better only with him our perfect wisdom and might he alone has true counsel and understanding behold he tears down and it cannot be built, rebuilt he imprisons a man and there can be no release behold he restrains the waters and they dry up Again, he sends the waters out and they overwhelm and devastate the earth. These are examples of when God does intervene and he, it's, it's, he sovereignly de decides, this is the time I'm going to stick my nose into the world and make something happen. But don't confuse that with complete sovereignty where he's exercising control of everything at all times with him are might and sound wisdom the misled and the misleader are his and in his power he makes great and scheming counselors walk barefoot and makes fools of judges he looses loosens the bond of kings and binds their loins with a loincloth he makes priests walk barefoot, and he overturns men firmly seated and secure. He deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment and discretion of the aged. He pours contempt on princes and nobles and loosens the belt of the strong, disabling them. So yes, God does do all these things. But at the same time, man does things too. And some of our problems are caused by our own decisions, our own actions. That's what we learned from the book of Proverbs. Make good decisions. Do good actions. And you will prosper. You will have health. You will have wealth. You will have a wonderful family and friends. <clears throat> a lot of this is up to us. Some things are not up to us, though. Sometimes God has a plan, and he makes it happen. And sometimes it's random. It's just the laws of nature that God has put in place are coming into effect. Some people think that every time there's an earthquake or that God is punishing in America. Every time there's a, a flood or some natural disaster, God is punishing the United States or some part of the world because of their, their sin. Well, as a, as a believer in the finished work of Christ, I want you to know that God is not angry with the world because Jesus paid for all of our sins. 
You paid for all the sins you've ever done in your whole life, and uh, including all the future sins, because when Jesus died on the cross, all of your sins were future to him. And yet all of our sins were charged against Jesus on the cross. Jesus dying on the cross is a propitiation for our sins. That means a satisfaction. God has been satisfied. The payment for the sin is paid in full. It's sufficient. His death was sufficient. So that's why God is not angry with the world and out there to, trying to wreak havoc on the world because man is sinning. Sometimes these bad things happen because it's just a cold wave hits a warm wave and creates wind. A fault and the tectonic plates reach a point where the stress is too much and there's an earthquake. Do you think God is causing all these things? It's just a result of less the laws that God established and a fallen world where everything is going from entropy. Entropy means everything is falling apart. That's a law. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything is going from order to disorder. That's why Darwinian style of evolution is so absurd that they think that things are going from disorder to order. And yet the second law of thermodynamics contradicts it. Everything is going from order to less order, to disorder, to chaos. Everything falls apart eventually. Verse 22, he uncovers mysteries that are difficult to grasp and understand out of the darkness and brings black gloom and the shadow of death into light. He makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away captive. He removes intelligence and understanding from the leaders of the people of the earth and makes them wander and move blindly in a pathless waste. They grope in darkness without light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. It is true. God intervenes. But he's not controlling every molecule in the universe where it is at all times. Every synapse in your brain, every thought. Otherwise, you would just be a mindless zombie robot puppet. And you could not be blamed for sin because God made you do it. Therefore, God is the sinner. God is the guilty party. You could go to the judgment and say, I'm not guilty. Everything I did was because God made me do it. Therefore, God, you're the guilty one. I'm innocent. That's the problem with the Calvinistic interpretation of sovereignty. Okay, let's go on to Job 13 now. I'll read it first in the KJV. Lo, mine eye hath seen all this, mine ear hath heard and understood it. What ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior to you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. He's still talking to his three so-called friends who have been pointing the finger at him and saying, all the bad things that have happened to you are your fault. God's doing it to you because it's your fault. You deserve it. Repent. Confess your sins. Wear sackcloth and ashes. <laughs> it just beg God to forgive you and because it's clearly your fault, Job. And he's saying, no, that's not the case at all. He says, you're forgers of lies. You are all physicians of no value. In other words, he's sick. He's, he's lost so much. He's suffered so much. And his friends are trying to console him and, and help him. 
He says, they're physicians of no value. They can't heal him. They can't help him. Oh, that ye would all together hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. Hear now my reasoning, and hearken to the pleadings of my lips. Will ye speak wickedly for God, and talk deceitfully for him? Will ye accept his person? Will ye contend for God? Is it good that he should teach, search you out? Or as one man mocketh another, do ye so mock him? He will surely reprove you if ye do, ye do secretly accept persons. Shall not his excellency uh, uh, make you afraid and his dread fall upon you? Your remembrances are like unto ashes, your bodies to bodies of clay. Hold your peace. Let me alone that I may speak and let come on me what will. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in mine hand? There's a question mark there. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hand? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But he will make mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite shall not come before him. Though he shall, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He also shall be my for a hypocrite shall not come before him. Okay, I'm going to go to the Amplified and read through verse 16. See what we can glean from that. It's a pretty powerful speech he's making to his so-called friends. Have you ever had friends like that? I'm afraid I have too. Chapter 13, verse 1 in the Amplified. Job continued, Behold, my eye has seen all this. My ear has heard and understood it. What ye know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. But I wish to speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue with God. But you smear me with lies. You defame my character most untruthfully. You are worthless physicians and have no remedy to offer. Oh, that you would be completely silent and that silence would be your wisdom. Please hear my argument and listen to the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak what is unjust for God and speak what is deceitful for him? In other words, they've been accusing God, saying God did this to you and you deserve it. Verse 8, will you show partiality for him and be unjust to me so that you may gain favor with him? Will you contend and plead for God? Will it be well for you when he investigates you and your tactics against me? Or will you deceive him as one deceives a man? He will surely reprimand you if you secretly show partiality. Will not his majesty terrify you, and will not the dread of him fall upon you? Your memorable sayings are worthless, merely proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of crumbling clay. Job is sure he will be vindicated. Verse 13, be silent before me so that I may speak, and let happen to me what may. Why should I take my flesh and my teeth and put my life in my hands, incurring the wrath of God? Even though he kills me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways to his face. This also will be my salvation, for a godless man may come, may not come before him. Job's not suffering enough from the afflictions Satan has put on him. 
and God permitted it. I talked earlier about why God would permit it. It's simply so that you and I can learn from this story. We can get perspective in our lives. Who among us can say they've suffered as Job suffered and lost what Job has lost? And yet God remained faithful and kept trusting God. So here he is afflicted. And his three so-called friends accuse him and accuse God, saying, Job guilty, you deserve this, and God's doing it to you. And Job is making quite the speech against his so-called friends. With friends like that, you don't need enemies. Okay, let's look at it again in the KJV. Hear diligently my speech and my declaration with your ears. Behold now, I have ordered my cause. I know that I shall be justified. Who is he that will plead with me? For now, if I hold my tongue, I shall give up the ghost. Only do not two things unto me. Then will I not hide myself unto thee. Withdraw thine hand far from me. And let not thy dread make me afraid. Then call thou, and I will answer, or let me speak, and answer thou me. How many are mine iniquities and sins? Make me to know that my transgression and my sin. Wherefore hidest thou my face? No, wherefore hidest thou thy face? And holdest me for thine enemy? Wilt thou break a leaf driven to and fro? And wilt thou pursue the dry stubble? For thou writest bitter things against me and makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. Thou puttest my feet also in the stalks and lookest narrowly unto all my paths. Thou settest a print upon the heels of my feet and he as a rotten thing consumeth as a garment that is moth eaten. I, I, I hope that, uh, you know, if you happen to catch this video here, that you do not just settle for this one study. I hope that you go back to the beginning of the Job study and learn everything that has transpired before this. That way you can really understand what's going on here. Um, as I said, it's Satan that's doing it. God is permitting it. And the reason is so that we can have perspective by reading this story over millennia. The story has been repeated. And, and these friends of Job are accusing him and saying he deserves it. It's his fault. And he's saying, I don't know why I would deserve it. I haven't done anything to deserve this. He sincerely believes he's, he's innocent. And, 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 but he is questioning, is God doing these things to him? He doesn't even understand that it's not God. It's Satan. God permits it. And he permits it, but the story will end well. But he permits these bad things to happen. And it took me many, many years to understand why. And, and the, the reason I've, I've stated numerous times already as we've studied these previous chapters. It's so that we can have perspective in life and say, well, what about Job? No matter what our troubles are, we can say, what about Job? Are my troubles as bad as Job? We're all going to suffer in life. It doesn't matter how many good things you have. If you have good looks, you have talent, 
you have fame, you have fortune, you have relationships and friendships. Doesn't matter how many good things you have, you're going to suffer. And when we, how will we deal with it? Are we going to blame God? Are we going to lose our faith? Are we going to become bitter? Job continued praising God, even though he didn't understand. He continued appealing to God and trusting God. Let me read this last part here in the uh, KJV, I mean the Amplified. Starting with verse 17. Listen diligently to my speech and let my declaration fill your ears. Behold now, I have prepared my case. I know that I will be vindicated. Job knows he hasn't done anything to deserve this. Who will argue it and contend with me? For then I would be silent and die. O oh Lord, do not do two things to me, and then I will not hide myself from your face. Withdraw your hand from me and remove this bodily suffering, and let not the dread of you terrify me. So he is doing the right thing, and he is praying to God for healing, for relief. And that's the response we should all have. Verse 22, then, Lord, call, and I will answer, or let me speak, and then reply to me. How many are my iniquities and sins that so much sorrow should come to me? Make me recognize and understand my transgression and my sin. That also is a worthwhile prayer. Even though our sins are paid for, uh, it, our sins do have effects in our lives. So our desire should be to not sin, to live a life that is totally pleasing to God. And yet we cannot do that perfectly. Even the Apostle Paul said that he was carnal. He said the whole Corinthian church was carnal. And yet they were children of God. They were saints. They were babes in Christ. And even Paul, mature in the Lord, an apostle. And he struggled. He says, I want to do the right thing and I don't do it. I don't want to do the wrong thing, and yet I do it. Oh, wretched man that I am, but I know it's not really me that's doing it. It's sin that lives inside me. It's the old man, the old nature still lives there. And the new man, the Holy Spirit, the re regenerated child of God is, is there and trying to transform me. And yet there's a struggle between the old man and the new man. This is how the Apostle Paul explained this. So, yeah, we should include in our prayers, Lord, if I'm sinning, tell me what you want me to do. Tell me if I'm doing something wrong and, and strengthen me, and guide me so that I can do what's right. Why do you hide your face as if offended and consider me your enemy? Job doesn't understand. He was not. He doesn't understand that it's not God that's doing it, punishing him because he sinned. Verse 25. Will you cause a windblown leaf to tremble? Will you pursue the chaff of the dry things against me in your indictment? and make me inherit and suffer for the iniquities of my youth. You also put my feet in the stocks as punishment. 
and critically observe all my paths. You set a circle and limit around the soles of my feet, which I must not overstep. While I waste away like a rotten thing, like a garment that is moth eaten. Okay, that's chapter 13. I'm going to end the study there. A couple of Job 14. Job 14. Uh, before I close the show, I want to end this broadcast the way I end every broadcast, and that's with good news, because this is a very, very heavy, kind of depressing scene that we've been going through here with Job. And... Uh, we're going to learn a lot from it, but there's a lot to be joyful about for Job and, and for us. Have you heard the gospel? Gospel is a Greek word and it just translates to good news. Have you heard the good news? If you haven't heard the good news, I have good news for you now. You see, the Bible says that God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God loves us so much that in spite of our sinfulness, he had Christ, the Son of God, Jesus, die for us. So this gospel, it's not just good news, it's great news. It's the greatest news. It's the greatest story ever told. It's a love story. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, that means you and me, all of mankind, that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ, the son of God, God manifest in the flesh, God who became a man so that he could die for our sins. That whosoever believeth in him, whoever believes in Jesus, whoever puts their faith in Jesus, who trusts Jesus, who depends on Jesus, who relies upon Jesus for salvation, shall not perish. You will not go to the great white throne judgment, be found lacking and end up in the lake of fire, suffering the second death. You will not perish in the lake of fire, according to John 3.16. Instead, you will have everlasting life. You will live forever. You will be immortal, eternal, You're living with God in the kingdom of God, heaven on earth forever and ever with joy and bliss. No more tears, no more sadness, no more, no more sickness, no more death. Joy and bliss forever and ever. That's good news. That's the best news ever. You see, the problem with humanity, and this started with Adam and Eve, and it's, it's, been, it's been the case all through the history of man, is that man says that we all like sheep have gone astray, everyone his own way. Man has gone his own way and departed from God and trusting in God instead decided either. So, man is, well, we'll just do what? we think is right. Well, what seems right to man is not right to God. It's not God's way. In Romans 10, 10, 3, it tells us that you, man is wrong. You're trying to establish your own righteousness, thinking that if you're just good enough, God will be satisfied and accept you. But 
It says, that's not God's way. God's way is we must trust in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We must believe in him for our salvation and not trying to work our way to heaven through our own efforts. If you could get to heaven simply by you being a good enough person, if God graded on some kind of a curve system and, well, you're one of the better people, then if that was possible, it says Christ died in vain. He died for nothing. Why was it necessary for Christ to die for our sins if you can go to heaven just simply by doing, having a good performance in your life? Jesus said that's impossible. He says, with man, it is impossible to get to heaven. With God, it is possible. The name Jesus means God saves. Put your face. The Bible says there's, there's salvation in his name. Put your faith in Jesus. Believe that he will save you. Stop believing that you can work your way to heaven and throw up your hands and surrender and say, I give up. I can't do it. It's hopeless. God understood it was hopeless for you and me. He knew that the standard we had to beat was perfection and we all fall short. That's why Jesus said he came down from heaven. He came down and he became a man. And he said he came to give his life as a ransom. That's why he came. That's why he became a man. He had to become a man in order to die for your sins and mine. And he did it. When he suffered and died on the cross, all our sins were paid for that, that very moment. Now your sins are paid for. Now you can have a relationship with God. God couldn't have anything to do with you because your sin was repulsive. Now the sins are removed and you can embrace Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will unite with your spirit and bring your spirit to life. You become a child of God, sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. What do you have to do? What must you do to be saved? There was a Philippian jailer that asked the Apostle Paul that question. What must I do to be saved? The Apostle Paul didn't say, repent of your sins, change your life, turn over a new leaf, uh, do all kinds of good, good deeds and keep your fingers crossed hoping it's good enough. He didn't say that. The Apostle Paul answered the question truthfully and succinctly. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what you must do. God has one requirement for all of us, and that is trust Jesus. Put your Say, I'm putting my fate in your hands, Jesus. I'm trusting you to get me to heaven. I give up. I know that I'm a failure. I can't get to heaven through my own efforts. I will fall short. No matter how religious we try to be, how good we try to be, we can't succeed. We can't be perfect. I need Jesus. Admit that you need to be saved. Admit that Jesus is the Savior. Believe he's the only Savior. And believe he's faithful. He is faithful. He promises eternal life to you and me if we'll just trust him. Put your faith completely in him. Faith can't be 50-50. Okay, I believe in Jesus, but I've got to do my part. No. The Bible says that if it's by grace, it's not by works. In other words, it can't be mixed together because grace actually means no works. And works means no grace. They cancel each other out. So you have to choose. Do you want to get to heaven through works? Go ahead and try. You have to be perfect. It's already too late for you because you've already sinned. You're not perfect. But the other way is get to heaven through grace. And grace means that even though we don't deserve it, God will give us eternal life in heaven.
and we'll just trust Jesus. That's how it works now. That's biblical Christianity. Put your faith in Jesus today. And if you do, make a comment. Let me know. Join me every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time for more Bible talk with Brother Luke. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. <laughs>